symbolic uh, is you know demonstrating that that you know the cabinet can be uh, half men half women at the at the highest levels uh, it's about demonstrating uh, that that makes a better level of decision making but more than that and encouraging businesses to do that uh, but we do need concrete pay e like equity legislation we do need uh, transparency uh, legislation as well and we're moving forward on those kinds of things that will uh, you know eventually uh, move the markers in a significant way because when when women are not succeeding to the same level as men, uh, our society is poorer. Over the past 40 years, over the, my lifetime, uh, women entering the workforce have added a third to Canada's GDP. We're looking for where the next growth is coming from. That's an obvious place where proper empowerment of women entrepreneurs, of women in the workforce, is essential to create the kinds of uh, growth and benefits that we need in, a, in our society. You know, for what it's worth, uh, there is one other area that maybe Canada wants to look into because based on research that will be published uh, shortly, women are more affected and will be more affected by artificial intelligence, biotech innovations and automatization on the, uh, in the, in the uh, workplace. And it's quite fascinating to see that about 11% of women's job will be either completely removed or significantly affected, as opposed to 9% of men's job. So women are at a disadvantage. The, the numbers are a little bit higher for Canada, and I was really surprised by that. It also has to do with the fact that in the service industry, there are many tasks that are repetitive, that will be automated, and where Canadian women have their jobs, and that's where they will be. They will be hurt eventually. So I think anticipating that, and you know, putting in place the policies, helping people to adjust, making sure that they have the right skill sets in order to not resist, but adjust to those changes that will take place. I think will that's be really important for everyone, men and women. Right? Absolutely, and that's and that's one of the things. The fact that we have invested massively in AI, and we see Canada has leadership around that means nothing if we're not equipping our workforce, our citizens, to be able to handle that transition that is coming everywhere around the world. And that's why uh, on getting women into STEM, we have had uh, uh, significant investments. Uh, there is now a lot of pressure on universities to make sure that the research chairs are, are more gender balanced. Uh, but it also means investing to get women entrepreneurs, more women entrepreneurs, investing to get more uh, women in the trades as well, in terms of Red Seal trades. There's a lot of things that we have to do to prepare for the transition into the new work and making sure from the get-go that we're looking at reducing barriers to women is, is essential, even if it weren't the fact that there is a, 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 an inequality in the disruption, potentially. Let's talk about the elusive work-life balance, because, Madam Lagarde, I mean, you've obviously been able to juggle motherhood and a very demanding career. I, I've been able to juggle fatherhood. I was going to ask you, career. don't worry. That you just, I was going to ask you. Sorry, I, think I, I think you were probably going there and I cut off the gag. But I, yeah. Actually, my next question was, Mr. Prime, uh, Prime Minister, what about you? I think part of the problem is women are always asked that question. Men rarely are. Just so you don't think that I was being sexist against uh, the Prime Minister. Um, but, you know, what have you learned along the way that you feel could help other women in terms of, and, and fathers, mothers and fathers, in providing more support, more recognition for unpaid work, paternity leave, all kinds of things that you think would then kind of be the wind beneath their wings as they try to have a more active professional life? It takes a whole society. It's not just upon the policymakers. It's also upon uh, the corporate world. It's upon society as a whole. Um, I was lucky because you know, when my, my two uh, boys were born, I was a young associate in a law firm, but luckily I started my legal career in France. And France has these childcare centers and childcare facilities that, that are accessible. Uh, that They're not plenty. There is shortage. There could be more. But uh, it was, you know, su sufficiently available so that if you could plan your motherhood two years ahead, ah, <laughs> and register the kid to be born, <laughs> then you would have access to a child care center. Um, but it, I was also lucky because I, I took that fight within Baker McKenzie and I'm, I managed to get 
the partnership to agree that it's not because a young female partner goes on maternity leave, so to speak, for a month or two months, that she loses the benefit of her participation. So we put in place a system that equalized uh, the, the participation, which is the compensation that partners were receiving, and the male partners, because it was, you know, vastly male dominated in those days, agreed that they would, you know, chip in and, and pay for that. So what I mean is, it's policies, childcare centers, uh, special benefits made available for women who have a child, and I know that Canada is, is ahead of that, on, on that in that game, but also in the corporate world, there has to be a recognition that women, for a portion of their life are going to, at least for the moment, um, that we are the ones pregnant, we are the ones breastfeeding, we are the ones having those duties, and no matter how uh, you know, supportive a, a partner is going to be, we, we still conduct those activities. And the corporate world has to appreciate, recognize, and you have this thing which is back to, back to Bay Street business, Back to back to Bay Street. Does that mean something to any of you? Return to Bay Street. Return to Bay Street uh, for the financial sector. I think that's good, and many many uh, companies and corporates should acknowledge that and make sure that once a woman has contributed to a company, if she goes away for a period of her life, it should be made easier for her to come back, and there should be programs in place to accommodate and help her adjust to that world which she has left for a little while. And There's no reason why, as I did it my, for my first child, you go away for two weeks, you feel guilty for the rest of uh, the next few months, and, uh, and, and uh, not the rest of your life, I have to say. When they grow up, they recognize. I was so excited to go okay. back to work after I had children, but, and I don't feel bad about it because they're great girls. Anyway, Prime Minister, what about the, the use it or lose it maternity, paternity leave, and, and really trying to make sure that fathers, while they can't breastfeed, at least not yet, that they can, they take an active role in child rearing? Well, I think understanding that there's a, there's a new generation of fathers who are wanting to be more engaged, and I think helping that along, because if you imagine, we, we are bringing in uh, next year, uh, use it or lose it, five weeks of uh, second parent leave, uh, which of course will be mostly, mostly used by, by fathers, hopefully, where if you imagine an employer hiring uh, you know, a 25-year-old, he's got to know that, or she's got to know that whether it's a man or a woman they're hiring, if they're going to start a family, there's a chance that they take time off. And that sort of evens things a little bit. More than that, it also... Uh, gives men an opportunity to experience what I was just in a, a great round table uh, with women entrepreneurs, being the primary caregiver for uh, a, a few weeks. Understanding that it's you that has to change your plans because there is a bleeding nose uh, at, at daycare or in grade two. Uh, it's you who has to just sort of suddenly be the one stop for everything. I mean, I know I'm guilty of this when I'm in charge something goes wrong, I usually just have to wait till Sophie shows up and she, she helps me with the rest of the parenting stuff. And I'm a pretty good dad, but there, there is a, that idea of giving the responsibility to men uh, in a very explicit way leads to the kinds of societal shifts that we need where so much of the unpaid work, so much of the extra family tasks automatically fall on women and they shouldn't. There should be uh, much more shared equal parenting and these steps are the kinds of things that yes, government can do. And you're right, it's businesses, it's, it's the whole of society, but uh, we all have to, to figure out paths to be part of that and that's why I'm glad we're doing that. Um, gosh, I can't believe how fast the time has gone because we don't have that much time left, which is super annoying because I could talk to you all for another hour. But um, Madam Lagarde, let's, let's talk about not just participation, but leadership roles. You obviously have had a number of extraordinary leadership roles throughout your career. It's still frustrating that more women are not given the top jo jobs in these companies and these corporations. What can be done to change that? You know, I used to think that... Um there should not be quotas. But I have massively changed my mind on that. And I think that if we do not have in place um, distributed quotas, I, I'll go a bit, uh, one step further than what I used to say. Uh, it has to be distributed along the hierarchy of a company. Uh, because it's all very well saying there has to be parity. Yes, there will always be parity. But if you start distinguishing between the uh, supervisory positions, uh, the leadership positions, the management position, and then the sort of overall size of a company, uh, it's a whole 
big difference between the top numbers, which are generally low, the bottom number that are very generally high, and the overall, which is pretty much average and makes everybody proud. Well, there has to be distributed quota, and if we want to make sure that there is the pipeline from which women will be selected and will prove themselves according to all the normal regular rules, but if that pipeline is not in place, it's never going to happen. And for the pipeline to be there, we need to have those distributed quotas throughout the organizations. And in fact, Prime Minister, less than 10% of Canada's senior corporate jobs are held by women. So what are you going to do about that? Well, I, well, I mean, I, one of the things I talk about, just in terms of the pipeline, we were worried about that pipeline. That's why we, before it could be 2015 and we have a gender balanced cabinet, uh, I had to go out and we recruited in 2014, 2013, 2012, and got women to step up into politics. Now the challenge is around retention uh, because politics is still a very difficult game and it's not necessarily. Um, it's still, there's still huge barriers and old boys approach in many ways uh, that cause real challenges and therefore how we're changing the culture within uh, the, the, the political world we're in, including things like Me Too and sexual harassment, uh, become really, really important around making sure that women make it from that entry level to the top level positions and more of them. So it's not just the entry pipeline, as you've said, it's maintaining a progression throughout all levels of, of business and of, of politics. And that's something that requires constant engagement and mostly constant listening, open, safe conversations about the real challenges and the real barriers are really hard to have in a corporate or political session context, but they're so important. And, and, and in closing, Madam Lagarde, I mean, how do you see the, the Me Too, Time's Up movements, which really have become global phenomenons, how, how do you see them changing the conversation and pushing these issues forward? Because as we saw in the video, and as I know you'd know, sexual harassment is a real problem in terms of keeping women in the workforce and even attracting them to some sectors of the workforce. Well, they are more than welcome movements, and, uh, and movements that, as you said, have spread in many advanced economies. I wouldn't think that you know, all emerging and low-income countries have yet been contaminated properly, and they should be. Um, I like that phrase, contaminated properly. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's, it's critically important. And then there has to be that um, ownership by man and woman, both, uh, that this simply cannot happen and that it's, it has to be talked about, it has to be raised at the highest level at all tables, and not just you know, in the kitchen or in the backyard. And having women in leadership positions is, uh, is a very effective antidote. Absolutely, yeah, that's, that is, I mean, it certainly inhibits uh, many of those who would otherwise not talk about it, fear of retaliation. So I think pushing uh, the women in, at all levels of society, politics, uh, private sector is, is critically important. And they have, these women, once they're there, they have to carry the flag and they have to protect, cover, enhance, and, and, and be the spokesperson as well, which they don't always do. All right, on that bummer of a note, <laughs> Madam Christine Lagarde, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, thank you both so much for being here today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Katie. Thank <laughs> you.